Welcome everyone, it's Frank here from Talking Grace and today's topic is going to be that on the New Covenant. Oh, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Uh, I say that because we don't really talk about the New Covenant much, do we, in religion? Very few. There are a few, uh, excuse me, grace teachers who do t focus on the New Covenant. It's great. It's, I learned so much listening to them. And so uh, I want to just share s something from, from the New Covenant that is good for us to know because we are believers. We are, uh, you know, we... Uh, a children of God, and it's good for us to remind ourselves why it's so good. But let me ask you this, why is it good? <laughs> I can ask it again, why? You see, when you hear preachers and organizations, and it's it's interesting, the one thing that they will tell you is that the two covenants, the old covenant given to the nation of Israel with Jehovah God, that contract, right, is for them. But the new covenant, of course, is for Jew and Gentile. And that also it was given by, given from Jehovah God, but to the world. So the idea is we have two covenants with the same person who's, who's writing up or underwriting the contract for two, for two people, for two organizations or for two entities, right? Now, to me, that's a little bit odd, right? Because one supersedes, one isn't superseding the other. One is just better than the other, right? There's no adding, there's no transition. It's not a transition from an old to something becoming better, right? It is two separate arrangements. The old covenant is got has got had sorry six hundred and thirteen laws and still has it in it, which is very much a works based covenant. Okay, uh, and the new covenant is very much a spirit based covenant. One you had to do, right? You had to make promises. I promise to live up to all this. It had blessings and cursings. It had a whole system of worship, you know, with um, a temple, um, sacrifices, um, even circumcision for men. Right Then you had the new covenant, which is primarily uh, one needs to just believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God that is dead, raised now, sitting at the right hand of God, believe Him, that He was the Son of God. Uh, you are saved when you believe Him. So that's one thing you got to do. The next thing is that you, the next command is to love each other as Christ loved us. So that's it. And we're walking by spirit. One is by flesh. One is by spirit. Um, and so you wonder, if it's the same God, why didn't He just give this new covenant to the nation of Israel, right? That would make sense. Why why not have given it to them? So this nation, right, they they could have benefited up front and then have the benefits flow out to the nations around. Why 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 didn't that happen? I mean if it's the same God. So it's interesting. One of the things that uh, I appreciated um, in coming to grace, in understanding grace, that in the new covenant, you're totally forgiven for all your sins, right? Past, present, and future. <clears throat> and that uh, you are, are a new creation today. The day you believe God gives you a new heart, Holy Spirit dwelling in you, Christ is in you, you got all the spiritual blessing. It's a gift. You have not earned it. You did not make a vow for it. It is just given to you. Right? So that's that was a marvelous thing for me to appreciate. And I, sp I've, I have spoken on that these topics a lot on this channel. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to the New Covenant uh, and the Old Covenant Law of Moses... So the, the problem lies here is 
there's a lot of religions and Christian people still mixing the two up. They feel one is binding with the other, or they feel that there's certain requirements, like the Sabbath in particular, needs to be applied to the uh, New Covenant, or other things, right? Or the principles, the Ten Commandments, the principles out of that, you know, can be applied to a believer. Uh, and I and I kept on thinking to myself, uh, why do these ideas hang around? Why do people, pastors, preachers, religions, insist on looking back to the old, as if it still applies in even in principle? You can be applied in principle to a new covenant believer. Why? If I'm not under the law, but under grace, why do people think it's the same? You know, like because you know that that there's some merit in that. Well, it's because they feel that it is from the same God. It is underwritten. These contracts are underwritten by the same God. Now, I'm here to say that that's not right. They can't be right. Right, and and I'm going to tell you why. When you, for example, I don't know, take out life insurance. Right, you know who the company is that is taking out, and they, when you buy into a life insurance or a, any type of insurance, car rental insurance, you, you know what I mean, home and contents insurance, business insurance, you'll have your uh, who the uh, person is that is guaranteeing this policy. You'll have the terms and conditions. There's usually pages of them, right? Then they'll give you an overview, a very simple overview. It says, here's your benefits, right? $10,000 insurance, monthly repayments is this. Here's um, excess if you make a claim. Now, of course, the devil is in the detail, right? Obviously. And there's a lot of the times you can't make claims on these things. But here's the thing. This is what you got to remember. The person that's writing that type of a, a contract is not going to then tell another another policyholder, uh, listen, your contract is nothing like this contract. No, your contract is actually nothing. There is no payment, no fee. In fact, I'm going to give you everything. Right? Uh, I'm going to give you your house. I'm going to give you your car. I'm going to give you life insurance. I'm going to give you everything you need. <laughs> okay? But I'm the same insurer. Yeah, does that does that work? Do you, do you, do you not see how how crazy that is? How that idea would be crazy. No no everyone would laugh at you if you said, "Well, they're the same. It's the same company." One, you know, for for some reason, depending on which side of the the line of the equator you live, in other words, if you were before Christ, and, and you, you know, and it was just specific to the the Jewish nation, well, they had this really bad deal. Right? They were promised a lot, but it came at a heavy price. If you were born after the cross, and you accepted Jesus. Well, you're just given everything. You didn't even have to do anything for it. And you're forgiven for everything. Plus, you know, it's, you know, you got a huge inheritance, but it's the same person. And by the way, that old covenant, it's still in play. Now, how confusing is that? Honestly, just to a, a normal person would say, mate, that's ludicrous. That doesn't make sense. And the reality is it doesn't make sense when you stop to analyze it. When you stop and look at the characters behind the two covenants, you start to see that the new covenant is fantastic. Why? Because it's coming from a loving God who has nothing but love for the person that wants to accept his son and him. The, on the other hand, the nation of Israel, there was no love in that. There was no love at, at all when that contract was done. It was a business deal, right? The author behind that one, who underreads that, 
wanted to make a name for himself and wanted to have some people subjected to him and wanted them to work. In fact, the, the, the whole idea about the law is that it was a ministry of death. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3. It was an obstacle uh, and hostile to the new covenant body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. It was a ministry, it was a curse, Galatians chapter 3. These are the terms I'm not using. These are the terms that the apostles are using. All right? This is how they looked at it. So it's interesting then, what could be the reason that people continue preaching two covenants by the same God, right? One's walking by the flesh, as we said, that's the old covenant, and one's walking in the spirit. So you know, it's something that we need to tackle. The problem lies in the, the fact that we've bought into this idea that it's the one God. And that's the biggest problem I see in all this. Um, years ago, I mean, trying to sort of wrap around this idea, when when they started to talk about there was a one God with two covenants, there were there were some or a few at least that we know of we can point to who were actually fighting against this idea, a heresy in their eyes. One was, I mentioned it before, I mentioned in his name before, was Marcion. He was born around 70 AD. He fought against that idea. No one could refute his arguments. He said that the Old Testament God was evil and that he was nothing like the New Testament God that Jesus spoke about the Father. Nothing like him. He said he was evil we should reject that. Now, of course, um, the church fathers were all over the place. There was many who were believing all sorts of things. Some were believing this or that or, or, or the other. No, none of them were in agreement. Many of them were just, you know, finding their own way, adopting philosophies and all sorts of different teachings. And it was under the Roman Empire that a lot of this um, was cemented and made into folklore or made into law that one, these are the teachings that we now believe and these are the Bibles of the, of the book of the Bible that we are going to canonize and make it whole, right? And rejected many other uh, books. Here's an interesting quote from Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson. He said this, so early on, uh, early on, I believe the early believers were uh, deceived into, and tricked as they started to uh, apostatize, if you like, from the truth that they received from Jesus and then the apostles. Um, and then the Catholic Church took root and enforced its, um, its teachings and they enforced that the gospel that they were believing was coming from the same God that, that was of the nation of Israel, Jehovah. And he was the father. And so this is why for centuries, 1700 years, you know, it's it's only been mayhem in this world. Um, thanks to a lot of it is also um, a lot of bad stuff is done by Christianity. But Thomas Jefferson said this, the, con the clergy converted the simple teachings of Jesus into an engine for enslaving mankind and adulterated by artful artificial constructions into a contrivance to filch wealth and power for themselves. These clergy, in fact, constitute the real Antichrist. So we know at the point of the sword in pursuit of earthly power and riches, it used methods that similar to Jehovah when he took over certain lands for the promised land like Canaan and others. Um, that those they they took it by force. In fact, he's known as a manly god of war. So this is the god that people want to say is is the new covenant is is the same person. Now, I, friends, I'm going to say that's false. That is outright false. That that could not be true. That could not be true. It'd be the furthest from the truth. There'd be no way that Jehovah God would do a do a what is it a 180 a complete 180 in his thinking and go no nah, you know what i made a mistake 
that was a mistake. You see, what did the law do? The law incited sin. That's what Paul says. It incites your sin. It inflames your passions, right? It lifts it up. Now, would the Father do that? Right? Would the Father encourage you to sin? Well, how would he do that? Well, he's obviously going to write 613 laws to see how, so, so you can see how sinful you are. Right? Do you agree with that? Because if you do, you're saying that the Father wrote all that up. That the Father's behind people um, being, in, uh, being encouraged, getting the flesh all wound it up to sin. Right? That's what you're saying. That's what people are saying. You know, I remember hearing a talk. Uh, it was in Sydney. And the, and the speaker made this point. He said, we don't have to go... We don't have to learn from the school of hard knocks, right, to know what it's like. In other words, you know, we don't, you know, some people say, well, you've got to go out and party, do the drugs, all that, so you know you can relate to people who are drug addicts, sinners, you know, adulterers, and all that. And the only way you can do that is by living that life, so you can relate. Right? That's what the law did. The law got, instead of um, helping you to be better, it never did that. It actually incited you to get worse, even if it had rules. You know what the best thing would have done, been done? Because there's nothing wrong with the law. I'm going to say this now. There's nothing wrong with the law. If you just leave it on the shelf and you don't sign off on it. You see, the mistake the Israelites did was they agreed to do it. That's their mistake. But if they just left it in the corner on the bookshelf, that would have been, oh, oh cool. That, that, that's interesting. I've read the 613 laws. There's a lot of curses in there and there's a lot of uh, ghastly things I don't think I really want to do. Right? It goes against who I am as a person. So uh, I'm going to say no, thank you. That would have been the best thing to do. Right? So there's nothing wrong with the law. Now, notice what... He, but there was a fault in it, right? And the fault was that if you try to live under it, it would show you up as a sinner. And so that was the fault of the law. It really was. <laughs> and so who, who, who would write such a law, right? If, it's, if we're talking about a loving father, do you think a loving father wants you to sin? Well, that's what the law was doing, right? It was encouraging you to sin. Have a look at uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, and this is where the New Covenant is talked about. Um, it's interesting. Remember, we're talking about rightly dividing the word. So let's do that. Let's see how he does this in the, the writer of Hebrews. He starts off by saying, But now hath he attained a more excellent ministry, this is Jesus, by how much also he is a mediator of a better co covenant, which was established upon better promises. So we have a new covenant, a better one, right, with better promises. So therefore, the other one was inferior with inferior promises. Are we talking about the same God? Are we sure we're talking about the same God? <clears throat> no, there can't be. The Father's not giving us a uh, one, one, you know, one crappy deal and then one really good deal. No, he wouldn't do that. He's just going to give us a good deal because he is good. Remember what Jesus said? He is good. The Father is the only one that's good. Okay. So we see it immediately, not me, the writer of Hebrews is establishing a point. All right, so we get that in 6. And then 7, he says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, so therefore the first covenant was f with fault. Right? <laughs> the Father doesn't give faulty um, deals. Anyway, it says that for if the first covenant had been faultless, then sh then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. So here we see now a promise is made, 
right, that there would be a new covenant. Now, this is not the same God. Now, this is why we have to rightly divide the word, right? So, in and here's, here's where, it, where it gets a little bit interesting. In this covenant, in the new covenant, in the old covenant, where, oh, where is it? In the old covenant, it was lot, largely about what you would do, right? Um, it was about um, you making those promises. But in the new covenant, it's about you keeping the, uh, you just agreeing to what God is saying he would do. For example, <clears throat> uh, he says here in, in Hebrews chapter 8, he says, in the new covenant, he says, oh, I made, uh, hang on. For this is the covenant. In verse 10, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I will put I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of the greatest. And then he says, and I'll, um, For I'll be merciful to their own righteousness and the sins and the iniquities I will remember no more. So it's interesting here. Now he's rightly dividing the word. Now if you look at Jeremiah, there's a slight change. There's a slight change in this words. You see, a lot of people are trying to make this um, law, this uh, new covenant, say, no, no, see, it's the, it's the law. So what, what God is doing is taking the law, the Father is doing, taking the law, and putting it into our hearts. Okay, let's have a look at closely. We'll see that's a mistake. That's an error in thinking. An error in understanding. Because the spirit, we have to rightly divide. With the spirit in us. He says, I will put my laws. Now Jeremiah doesn't say laws. It says law. But here he's saying laws. Right? Plural. Laws. So he, he's showing there's a difference here. He's not... Because the, the Mosaic law is referred to as the law, not the laws. Right? You see how that works? So we need to be aware that there is a... That the, the, the writers are also tweaking, tweaking text. They'll, they'll see the text from the past. They'll go... Mm, this is how it's applied here. <laughs> and they'll tweak it. They'll change some words. Right? Because remember, prior to the death of Jesus, and, and if you're not a child of God, Paul says there's a veil covering the Old Testament. So therefore, you can't, you can read it. You know, atheists can read it. Anyone can read it and, and make uh, determinations. But they get the full sense of it and know the identity of, of characters in there, especially who's who, and especially the author of the covenant, is that there's a veil. It is only revealed to the person who is a child of God. It doesn't mean that they will pick it up, right? But that person has the Holy Spirit in them, and the Holy Spirit will teach them the truth. <clears throat> and so this is what is important to understand. So what makes the new covenant new then? <clears throat> so now that I've laid that down for you as my opening statements regarding that there is two gods and one, uh, two covenants with two separate deals, why does it make it, what what makes it different? Well, we know that the, the Moses took blood um, and so, and that made that covenant binding. So Jehovah dealt with a, a, a blood economy. Jesus' blood um, authorized a release from that contract. So then those Jews included could leave that contract and be part of the new contract. That's why they were given the first option. Okay, And then it spilled out to the Gentiles. Um so some of the things that's why this makes it better, the Old Testament is a record 
we know of the nation of Israel struggling and failing to keep its covenant to Jehovah God. Um, according to Paul and John, uh, there was a curse, sin-inducing. It was a ministry of death. It was, wasn't was designed to save you, but keep you under a yoke of slavery. Uh, the New Testament Jesus shows <coughs> it, uh, Jesus kept the old covenant up for his people, uh, doing what they cannot do. He ransomed hum humanity with his blood from the curse and deathly ministry introduced by Jehovah. Theologian Martha Lu uh, Martin Luther called the contrast between the two covenants law versus grace. Uh, a, a more familiar name would be works versus grace. So Jesus is superior to the Moses as a mediator. Uh, he's the high priest forever, sealed, seated next to God in heaven. His sacrifice was once for all, uh, perfecting believers for eternal life. The complete and total forgiveness of all your sin is in the new, past, present, and future, including in this is the blessings, including the free gift of Christ's righteousness, holiness, uh, and the very life. All these blessings testify to God's grace. It is a covenant of grace, the new one. Uh, in the old law, old law based covenant, you reaped what you sowed, okay. But in the new, you reap what Christ has sown. So that's that's fantastic, right? So, grace uh, is a gift, uh, and every, and we have received every spiritual blessings of Jesus. Uh, in the old covenant, it was a covenant of works, right? Uh, work, work, work. That was all what it was done. To, you had to really be a worker. That was part of the deal. But the new covenant is a covenant of rest. You know, um, only when we rest in the finished work of Jesus can God begin His good work in us. So, good works don't produce grace but grace produces good works and that's how we should start to look at things um, in the old covenant it was uh, always pursuing work um, demands by god were always needed to be met and so there was never really a rest period but in the new covenant is a rest and peace because now we have the holy spirit in us uh, so we are encouraged to rest as a believer. It's a covenant of, of a new life. Okay, um, The old covenant preaching, uh, when you look at 2 Corinthians 3.14 and you looked at it, it, it sort of made you dull. It made you a little bit silly, stupid even. It hardened your heart. Right, A lot of old, uh, that covenant hardened people's hearts. And that's why there was the encouragement always to soften your heart right or cleanse my heart like david said cleanse my heart because they had a wicked heart it wasn't a good heart it wasn't encouraging it was no way to clean your heart in that old covenant <clears throat> but the new covenant removes the veil and reveals the lord's glory as you behold him you become like him transformed by the holy spirit that's in second corinthians three eighteen. See, under the old, um, you know, there was a little bit of improvement, you know, with if you kept some of those moral codes, sure. Um, but <clears throat> let's face it, without a new heart, without a new, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and without being a new creation, like born again, as we are as believers, I mean, you were just behind the eight ball all the time in the old covenant. So we are born of spirit, which is fantastic new. As, as we're saying, we've got a new heart. We're a new person. This is the new covenant because we have the Father is behind this. The good God, right? He's behind all this. We are no longer a prisoner of sin, but we're co-heirs with Christ. It's a union, a covenant of, it's a union now, right? We're in a relationship, father-son relationship. Um, the old covenant lived God, Jehovah God, who lived in a temple, as you know. And who could enter into that temple to have a one-on-one -on -one with Jehovah God? Could you, if you're a, just a, an Israelite? Could any anybody just walk up there and go into the Holy of Holies? No, nobody. 
Oh, one person, the high priest could go in, right? And it was only a couple of times a year, or I think. And the thing with him <laughs> going in, well, as the story goes, they used to tie a rope around him because if for some reason he was not clean, you know, they waited. If he didn't fall to the ground, they knew he was not going to die. Can you imagine that? Presenting yourself before Jehovah God. Wouldn't you be like crapping yourself? You know, um, I hope I've washed my hands right and my hair's cleaned and my toenails right, all that. Um, did all the ceremonial cleansing. I uh, hope I haven't missed anything because that, you know, he, he'd kill you. Jehovah was a legalist. You have to understand that he was a legalist. And he was someone that if you did not obey, he would just, if he said he, you're, you're dead, you were dead. He did that with Adam and Eve. He did that with Uzzah. Remember Uzzah? He just touched the, um, the ark. It was falling over. I, I want to steady it up. Bang. No, dead on the spot. This is the God that they that they agreed to worship. They agreed to his terms. That was their bad, worst day in history, I believe. Um, but instead, as in the new covenant, we are one with the Lord as he is holy. We are the temple, right? You are. You are the temple. And the Spirit, Holy Spirit lives in us. I mean, God has come down to our level. The Father has, has, has made it so. Because he loves us, right? He's adopted us into his into his family. So because that is the case, and we are one with the Lord Jesus as well, he has made us holy, righteous, perfect forever. Isn't that amazing? Don't you just think that's awesome? How come the Israelites couldn't get that deal if it's the same God? Well, friends, the answer is simple, because it's not the same God. It's, they're two different contracts. It's not the same God. And it would be ludicrous. Can you imagine now the Israelites going, well, why didn't you just do that to us? Why didn't you just give that to us? Wouldn't they be complaining? Right? I mean, I would. I'd say, man, I've got, I've got a raw deal with this one. You know? <clears throat> Uh, with the, the Father, you are complete in, in Christ. In As you know, as we go along in life, you know, it's not about how cranking out works. God is not going to get you. No, He loves you. He's not asking you to do anything. He's asking you to take it easy. You know? That's the beauty about it. And you know what that does? It diffuses. It, it makes religion weak. It, it, it drops their power over you off. It releases you from their captivity. It makes you strong and powerful. You are no longer ob obligated by religious policies and procedures as if you're trying to win God over. He, he loves you. He's given everything to you as, as a promise, as a gift in the new covenant. It's a covenant that cannot be broken. The old covenant was underwritten by failed promises, right? But the new covenant is better promises, as we just read. Uh, in the old covenant, remember, it was told that you must love God with your whole heart. Remember, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest command? He said, you must love Jehovah God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, and make sure if someone does wrong, you know, you make sure you go and um, <clears throat> sort something out. Don't just offer your your uh, sacrifices to the temple. Make sure you sort things out. Leave your sacrifice at the altar, you know. Otherwise, God won't forgive you. But here, the Father, in the New Covenant, He forgives you. Totally, totally forgiven. And why is that? It says that He first loved us. He first loved us and then and forgave us. Not the other way around, friends. <laughs> the old covenant was between God and Israel, but the new covenant is between the Father, the Son, the Father and the Son. We are recipients in the new covenant. You see the difference? See, Jehovah made it with the people. 
he knew that they, they'd never be able to live up to it, but he gave him a shot. Give it your best shot. But it didn't work, right? In, in this new covenant, God's word is between him and his son. And he holds up both ends of the arrangement. He swears by himself, 2 Corinthians 1.22. And he gives us his spirit as a guarantee of what is to come. So he's assured us of that. Under the old covenant, you were blessed if you obeyed, right? But under the new, you were blessed because Jesus obeyed. Your salvation is internally secure because it is Jesus who saves and keeps you, not anyone else. You're not, in other words, not you. It's not about you and you trying to do it because you can't. <clears throat> Ultimately, you know what I love about these two covenants? How what, what you see in these two covenants? You see the heart of God's. You see the heart of Jehovah God in the first covenant. You see it. What do you think of that covenant? And then you see the heart of the Father in the new covenant. <coughs> um, the Father really was giving grace throughout history. He gave it to the first Adam. Uh, he gave it to Abraham with uh, just believing in his word, you know, and he said, you'll be blessed and, you, and nations after you will be blessed. Just on the belief, right? Um, the the worst decision that the Israelites ever did was believe that um, this guy Jehovah would solve their issues. Well, he did temporarily, but he came at a hefty price. But this is not the father. The father didn't put any of those pressures and and obligations on any human. Abraham, do you believe? Yep, done. Everyone's going to be blessed because of your belief. <laughs> Did he ask him to go and jump off the bridge after that? No, he didn't do that. <clears throat> Remember, rightly divide the word. Just be careful what you say after that, right? Because not everything is coming from the Father. Old Covenant, Old Covenant emphasizes on rules and will cause the, the you know, because it, it, it see, this is funny. Because it, it, it um, emphasizes rules, what do you become? Don't you become a legalist and a bookkeeper and an accountant all in one? Because you, now you're keeping score of everything, keeping a record of things, right? You do. And you meet many Christians who are like that. And that's, that's because of the old covenant. That's nothing to do with the new covenant. It's all old covenant mentality, and they bring it into the new covenant. <clears throat> The reality is, uh, the Father is not like that. He loves you and He holds nothing against you. And He just wants you in a way that, like, you know, like think of the prodigal son. He's just happy to see you come home, puts a feast on the table for you. You don't have to worry about your prepared speech. He, he, he's not interested. He just loves you for who you are. <clears throat> to me, both the Old and the New Testaments are the story of two different gods. That's what they are. The new covenant is a God of love and mercy who gave his people the freedom to choose and who gives his people the opportunity to be adopted and not to be an orphan by believing in his son, Jesus Christ. Many Christians don't know what makes the new covenant new. As a, and then as a result, they are working to get what they already have. And that's the sad thing. To me, so how do you know your work? Walk, uh, you are in the new covenant. How how would you know, or walking in it? Ask yourself: Am I? How do I see myself? How do I identify myself? Do I identify myself as a son of God, as a servant of God, or as a friend of God? Maybe it's a bit of everything. Is God my judge? Is God going to get me if I don't do the right thing? Is God going to judge me harshly if I forget to say my confess my sins? Can I lose my salvation? Right. Do you see yourself as an employer or do you see God as your father? <clears throat> uh, if you don't see God as your loving father and yourself as a dearly beloved child, you probably haven't fully grasped what's happened. And maybe that's something you can preach, uh, pray about. So friends, what to me makes this really, this new covenant so important 
is the one that's who underrid it all. Uh, Jesus came to reveal the Father. That's what he said. And that is what makes the new covenant new to me. It is the person that has underrid it all and then given it to us as a gift. Life, total forgiveness of sins. And that is the Father. You see the heart of the Father in the new covenant. You don't see the heart of Jehovah, who was a manly God of war, who he himself said he is a jealous God. He said that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. I am a jealous God. Don't get me mad, right? You know love, God is love, the Father is love. Do you know what one of the traits of love is? Yeah, no jealousy. Love is not jealous. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. So friends, I hope you've uh, found this interesting for you. To me, one of the biggest problems I find in, in new, new, uh, new oh, Christianity alike and uh, people even, even in the grace community are just not accept, not, not trying to tackle the, the, the idea or at least trying to tackle that it's not one God, two covenants. To me, that's heresy. I'm just saying, no. I, 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 I think it will be so much better if people tackled this and start analyzing the characters of Jehovah God and the Father. They are totally opposite. You know, I was reading online a, a Catholic newspaper and they obviously object to this idea that there's two separate gods, of course, because they're the originators of the one God, two covenants. But you know what they said? You can't use the characters of God as a basis for that argument. No, you've got to use the intention. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how they can play on words, right? Don't, don't, let's, in other words, there is a problem if you look at the characters of God. So let's not use that argument. That's what they're saying. Isn't that interesting? So friends, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed. Why is it a new covenant to me? The first thing I look at now is who's underwriting the covenant. And that makes it new. It is not Jehovah God. It is the Father. He is underwriting the new covenant. And that makes it brand spanking new. So we should be grateful because we know that our Father loves us because look at the new covenant. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> what do you do to get it? And what do you, what is it that you're getting? Look at all the benefits. Uh, have a look at it again. Think about it. And you'll see that's just unbelievable. That is just totally opposite to the old covenant with the nation of Israel. So what I'm going to do is on my next, next topic is I'm going to look at Jehovah God wanting to make a name of Himself. Now we're going to. I'm still going to tackle this subject in who is Jehovah, right? Because I think you need to understand this. I'm not forcing you to understand it. You don't have to. You can switch off and go and look and hear other talks. That's fine. But if you want to know who is Jehovah, and I will present to you more evidence to show that Jehovah is not the Father. And in fact, the more you go into it, the less you're going to, yeah, it's going to like, uh, you'll, you'll see the veil unlift. However, it's those who believe will understand this. I believe. Deep down, they'll get it. I think, I think the, if, this, if, you're, if you're willing to uh, put your biases aside, Thanks, guys. It's a bit of a long video, I know. There's no no shortcuts to these videos. Um, frankly, they're, they're going to take a bit of time because the generations of teachings that we're trying to un, undo and unravel. So take care. Have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you soon. See you later.